If I had to choose one word to describe World War I, it would be cataclysmic. A single word to describe World War I would be catastrophic. Transformational, because nothing was the same once the war was over. I think the one word that helps to describe World War I is destructive. I would choose the word mistake. Stupid. That's how I would encapsulate the First World War. World War I did not have to happen. There was no inherent reason. It literally was dumb. A person during World War I thought they were in a new age, a fascinating modern world, the world that produced the Titanic, aviation, and incredible advances in medicine. It seemed like everything was within grasp right before World War I, and all of these would be smashed on the battlefields of Europe. From the very beginning of the road to war, to everything that comes out of the war and the peace plans, is not just one mistake, but a series of mistakes. People had the option to choose peace and time and again seemed to make the wrong decisions. It was lack of communication. It was intellectual rigidity. It was a simple falling of dominoes that never needed to fall. And so the children of the Renaissance and the Age of Reason the Enlightenment ended up massacring themselves in the mud and blood of the trenches. Not just destructive in terms of what happens to men's bodies on the battlefield, destructive in terms of global politics. The Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the grievous weakening of the British and French empires, the world that existed in 1918 was remarkably different from the one that existed in 1914. The whole globe was influenced by this war, and the transformational changes cover a wide range from technology and weapons. You see the first tanks, you see the maturation of artillery guns, machine guns, trench warfare. World War I begins the modern era. So welcome to World War One. Hopefully you enjoyed that intro. And World War One did some incredible things uh, as far as the world is concerned. Not all incredibly good, certainly, but some incredibly horrible things happened in World War One. Um, an extremely, extremely deadly type of warfare gets fought. And we're going to look today at what causes something like this to happen in the first place. So what you can see on the screen is that um, I was trying to choose an image that represented to some degree trench warfare. So this is largely a war that gets fought in a series of ditches, which makes um, for issues all by itself. And um, it starts with, in part, an assassination. The assassin that we're going to talk about in the next lesson, his name is Gavrio Princip, and I just like to start the day with him because he's only 17 years old, he is Serbian, and he is the assassin in this image right here, the one shooting at a very powerful heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne named Franz Ferdinand. So he's only 17 years old, um, just a year, maybe a year and a half older than you guys. And he's already a man due to the events in the historical context in which he lives. So World War I begins. Um, one quick thing to tie us back to where we ended. So when we left off, our last lessons were about the Congress of Vienna, the end of the French Revolution, and how the map of Europe gets redrawn at the peace treaty, which is called the Congress of Vienna, and how... Um, Germany actually comes out of that map. And so I wanted to just share with you because when our last lesson we were talking about Prussia and now we're all of a sudden talking about Germany and I thought you might wonder like where did Germany even come from? So here's Prussia and here's some of these like individual German states that are in this area where Germany is today. 
Prussia is going to fall apart and Germany is going to be a unified state by the 1870s. So here we go. So Congress of Vienna ends the French Revolution or the end of that Napoleonic era. era. And right in the, the uh, palace at Versailles, where you guys have seen lots of images of that uh, palace at Versailles, at, in the Hall of Mirrors, which is the entryway into the palace at Versailles, Wilhelm I was named Emperor of Germany, the very first emperor of the new Germany in 1871. And so between 1871 and the beginnings of World War I, this is the new German territory. And so I just wanted you to see, this is Otto von Bismarck, one of the early kind of unifiers of the German territories. And this is Kaiser Wilhelm, the guy that you'll read about at the end of the day. All right, away we go. Okay, so the causes of World War I include a lot of isms. So they're kind of abstract concepts. There will be four of them. And there are short videos that will um, coincide. So hopefully it will be clear. So the first concept is something called nationalism. The first cause of World War I. Here's some info. So while peace and harmony characterized much of Europe at the beginning of the 1900s, there were less visible and darker forces at work as well. Dun, dun, dun. Below the surface of peace and goodwill, Europe witnessed several gradual developments that would ultimately help push the continent toward war again. One such development was the growth of nationalism. That's okay. Nationalism, which is a devotion to a person's nation. It's kind of like patriotism. Nationalism can serve as a unifying force within a country, and that can be a good thing. But it can also create intense competition amongst other nations, each seeking to have, you know, its own nationalist sense be superior to the other. By the turn of the 20th century, which means the 1900s, a fierce competition indeed had developed amongst Europe's great powers. The nations that were at odds included Germany, Austria-Hungary, Great Britain, Russia, Italy, and France. This increasing rivalry amongst European nations stemmed from several sources, and some of this gets kind of complicated, but some of it was competition for um, materials and markets overseas. There were territorial disputes with one another. For example, France had never gotten over the fact that they had lost a piece of land called the Alsace-Lorraine to Germany in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, and Austria-Hungary and Russia both tried to dominate the Balkan region because um, that area has access to a waterway. And so just within that Balkan region, for example, there was really intense nationalism um, being displayed by Serbs and Bulgarians and Romanians and lots of other ethnic groups who wanted to be honest, their own independence. Another cause of World War I is imperialism. So second cause right here, imperialism. The nations of Europe competed really fiercely for colonies in Africa and in Asia. And the quest for colonies sometimes pushed European nations to the brink of war. As European countries continued to compete for overseas empires, their sense of rivalry and mistrust of one another deepened. So imperialism is when a stronger country goes out and seeks to control a weaker country or territory. And usually the reason they would do that is to extract resources. So during this time period, people were seeking out places where there was like rubber trees so they could fuel the industrial revolution or coal or iron ore or, um, or oil deposits eventually or gold, things like that. So they want lumber. 
So nations like Great Britain that were island nations would go off and seek these colonial empires that would provide them with all those materials. But the problem is, look at Britain over here in this political cartoon, taking half the world. Well, if you're going to take this whole half, there's guaranteed to be some other countries that would like some piece of that. So in particular, places like China got all divided up. This is the British and the Germans, the Russians and the Japanese and the French are all just kind of dividing up China and they're not even listening. Notice that the, the person that actually is native to China doesn't even have a place at this table. They're not even asking him what he thinks. They're just taking it and dividing it up. And the same thing goes with Africa. In 1881, there was something called the Berlin Conference and there are countries like Germany and Britain and France literally rolled out a map of Europe, uh, excuse me, Africa, and just started dividing it up. And you can see here that by the time they were done, almost none of Africa actually belongs to native African peoples. These sorts of things are bound to create problems. Other things um, to consider is that sometimes in an, in an attempt to create nationalism or pride in one's country, you can go overboard. And sometimes people blindly follow propaganda campaigns that tell, that tell them that their nation is the best and it can do serious harm to the rest of the world and to eventually to them. Okay, cause number three. Militarism. So if you are going to try to be one of the most powerful countries in the world, and you are going to go out and take other regions of the world, you need to be able to actually force someone to give over to you. And that leads us to militarism. Militarism is the, the cost of building up really powerful standing armies and navies that are, that are developed to be able to defend the empires that each of these countries wants to create. On average, European countries increase their military standing by about 300%. Germany developed an extremely strong army. And the British had a magnificent navy. And in fact, the British, for those that like a lot of detail, had something called the like dual dual and something like this. The, the whole idea was that British policy was to be twice as strong as the next most powerful Navy. So they wanted to make sure that they maintained their status by double. This led to an incredible amount of money being spent on their militaries, but that also meant that, um, that it, it spurred other countries that don't want to be taken over to also spend money on theirs. So it leads to this arms race around the world where every country is kind of competing to see if they can get stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger and mightier and mightier. And of course, by the time World War I actually happens, we have incredibly strong militaries that are brand new that are gonna be devastating each other. Here's just a quick look for you. I'm not, we're not going to spend a lot of time looking, but you could pause this if you wanted to and take a look between 1908 and 1913, right before the outbreak of war. In every instance, we see significant increases in the amount of money that is spent on militaries. In some cases, nearly double, but in all cases, significant increases in spending. The last cause of World War I are alliances. Here's just a little bit about alliances. So growing rivalries and mutual distrust had led to the creation of several military alliances amongst the great powers. It started as early as 1870. And the alliance system had been designed to try to keep peace in Europe, but instead it's gonna help push the continent toward war. Between 1864 and 1871, Prussia's blood and iron chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, you saw his picture earlier, freely used war to unify Germany. After 1871, however, Bismarck declared Germany to be a satisfied power, and he then turned his energies to trying to maintain peace throughout Europe. 
Bismarck saw France as the greatest threat to peace. He believed that France still wanted revenge for its defeat in the Franco-Prussian Wars. Bismarck's first goal, therefore, was to isolate France completely. As long as it doesn't have allies, Bismarck stressed, France poses no danger to us. In 1879, Bismarck formed the dual alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary. Three years later, Italy joined those two countries, and they formed something called the Triple Alliance. In 1881, Bismarck took yet another possible ally from France by making a treaty with Russia. But in 1890, Germany's foreign policy changed pretty dramatically. That year, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who two years earlier had become ruler of Germany, forced Bismarck to resign. A proud and stubborn man, Wilhelm didn't wish to share power with anybody. Besides wanting to assert his own power, the new Kaiser was eager to show the world just how mighty Germany had become. The army was his greatest pride. I and the army were born for one another, Wilhelm declared shortly after taking power. Wilhelm led his nation's treaty with Russia lapse in 1890, and Russia responded by forming a defensive military alliance with France in 1892 and in 1894. Such an alliance had been Bismarck's fear. War with Russia and France would make Germany the enemy of both, and Germany would then be forced to fight a two-front war, which means a war on both sides of its country. Next, Wilhelm began a tremendous shipbuilding program in an effort to make the German Navy equal to that of the mighty British fleet. Armed Great Britain formed an entente or an alliance with France. In 1907, Britain made another entente, this time with both France and Russia. Now this was called the Triple Entente. It did not bind Britain to fight with France or Russia. However, it did almost certainly ensure that Britain would not fight against them. So in 19, and that, that is called, well, never mind, it's right up here, the Triple Entente. By 1907, two rival camps existed in Europe. On one side was the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, also called the Central Powers later on. And on the other side was the Triple Entente, or France, Britain, and Russia. And I know it's a little bit confusing that we refer to the Triple Entente as allies because they do become the United States allies. But it's the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, which we also call the Central Powers. So the alliances that were supposed to keep people safe actually ended up um, pulling all of these nations into war as soon as an event occurred. So here's a map of those same military alliances with Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy here. And then, of course, Russia, the British, and the French creating their own alliance. And now something's going to happen right here in this area of the world. And the Russians are going to come to protect the Serbians. And that's going to, in part, begin this whole kind of snowballing effect. Okay, here's another chart showing military spending. And I just thought it might be interesting for you to see today. Well, this is as of 2014, 2015. But look at the military spending today. Build in the billions instead of millions. Okay, and we're going to end with another video clip on militarism. In Germany, new guns were made for the army, and by 1905, a huge fleet of warships was being built. But in 1906, Britain launched a new kind of fast and heavily armed battleship, the Dreadnought. Wilhelm didn't want to be left out. He wanted his own empire and navy to rival Britain's. When, as a little boy, I was allowed to visit Portsmouth and Plymouth, I admired the proud English ships. There awoke in me the wish to build ships of my own like these someday, and when I was grown up to possess as fine a navy as the English. 
So Germany announced that they would build four dreadnoughts. Britain wasn't going to be outdone, and soon the two countries were involved in a naval arms race. The great German landowning families supported the build-up of the armed forces. Like the Kaiser and his generals, they believed in German supremacy and wanted a German empire to rival the empires of Britain and France. As the Imperial German Navy, based on its North Sea harbors, grew year by year, Britain's sense of safety diminished. Lord Haldane, an admirer of much in Germany, summed the feeling up. We who live on islands and are dependent for our food and our raw materials on our being able to protect our transport could not permit that protection to be threatened by the creation of naval forces intended to make it precarious. Okay, now for the end of our day. What I imagine in most cases, what I would be assigning right here is the, um, is the reading on Kaiser Wilhelm II. And in our next lesson, we are going to talk about an assassination. See you next time.